welcome, welcome, welcome. I think we decided, we talked about, first we were going to tell a little story how we got into it, mm -hmm. and then we'd like to pass it on to you and hear about why you're here. Mm -hmm. So, go ahead. Ooh, me start? I actually was trying to remember how I got started. Oh, um, I definitely, I, I went to Fermentation Fest, I think it was probably four or five years ago, I can't quite remember. I had a toddler and an infant at the time and it's sort of all a blur. Um, but I did attend a class and that was sort of my first exposure to the variety of vegetables that you can ferment. That's the class I went to was focused on vegetables. And that was really just um, the leaping, the jumping off point for me. It just took kind of one class one person standing up in front of everybody and just talking about how fun and easy it is and how healthy it is for you. Um, that's pretty much, um, and I think I just, I don't know, that's about all I can remember. I've been doing it ever since. So it's not a great story, but <laughs> it's the truth. <laughs> yeah, see, I, I uh, started canning, not, not until I was well into my 30s. I don't come from a family that did any of that kind of stuff. But I decided I wanted to do that. So I started there. And then I thought, I started hearing how people, we were living in <coughs> Iowa at the time, about how people made their own sauerkraut and then ate it. And I thought, oh, <laughs> how do they do that? So I started doing some study like I did with my canning. And I ended up making a big five gallon bucket of sauerkraut. And when it was time, when it had done all its thing, and it was time to take the, the, the weight and the leaves off and see the sour, I was so afraid of what was going to be in there, I made my husband do it. <laughs> so he did it, and he says, it's fine. There's no funny color. There's no fuzz. And it tasted delicious. Unfortunately, at that point, I didn't know how healthy Furman fermented things were and then I turned around and canned it which kills everything now it lasted for a while but re believe it or not fermented things last for quite a long time so you don't have to can it after you ferment it so that was my first and after that it just I just I love it I love doing it so I shall we just go ahead and get started the first thing I was going to talk about and um, is yogurt. And here is some homemade yogurt. And it is quite thick. Um, I'm just going to put a little in here. We'll pass it around. Do we want to do samples right away or? Maybe we should talk about it yes. first a little bit. There we go. Yeah, we and I'll just pass it around so you can see it is quite thick. And that is nothing but milk. Um, it doesn't have any other additives to it except yogurt as an inoculant. I have a question. Is it just, what kind of milk is it? Can I use whole milk. Kind of whole milk. So just to give you a quick how this works, and we're going to do some samples so you can, t it doesn't have any sugar, it doesn't have any fruit, but you can add that if you want um, at home. But just to kind of talk about how it's made. So the first thing you do is you take your milk, you put it on the stove, and you heat it to about 110. And any book, any website will tell you this exact same thing, okay? But you heat it to about 110. You don't want it any hotter than that because it'll kill off the bacteria. You don't want it any cooler than that because it won't get thick. It will ferment, but it won't get thick. The thick, um, the bacteria that start, that causes it to thicken, and I'm sorry, I don't know the names of all the different bacterias, um, needs that level of heat to thicken it. And I have two methods that I use. This is the one I've used. I've, I've tried to do it lots of different ways, and I have found, it's, it's really hard to keep that 110 degrees for the 4, 8, 10, 12 hours, however long you want it, depending on how sour you like your yogurt. So I use a cooler. Um, I should put it back. Okay. 
I put a towel on the bottom, a heating pad inside. Now, I will tell you that if you want to heat it for, I usually do it overnight, so we're talking eight or 10 hours, you need a heating pad that will not automatically turn off and they're getting harder and harder to find. So um, I did happen to find this several years ago at Walgreens. I'm gonna guess the internet might have some, but they all want to have an automatic shut off because I guess we're too dumb to do that. So then I cover it again with another towel after I've heated my milk, what you do is you put, um, depending on how much milk. Now I, I did a gallon of milk. And um, you put, oh, quarter to a half. It is not rocket science. It is not exact. Quarter to a half a cup. You stir it in really good. Use a whisk. Make sure it's all whisk in there. Then you pour it in whatever containers will fit into whatever you're using to keep the heat in. I, I use quart jars. I use half gallon jars. Um, this one will fit gallon jars if I wanted to do that much. And so then I um, put, it, put it in there. I cover it with two more towels. Shut the lid. <coughs> Now you leave it until it's done. Like I said, it depends on how sour you like it. If you like it really sour, you may want to leave it in 24 hours. I don't. I usually do it just before I go to bed. And then when I get up in the morning, usually that's about 536. Then I take it out, put it in a refrigerator, and it's done. And it becomes thick on its own. What were those ratios again? You said it was a quarter cup of like... A quarter to a half a cup to, to about a gallon. Of, of yogurt? Of yogurt? Uh, a gallon of milk, quarter to a half a cup of yogurt. Okay. And, and so when you get down with the yogurt, you know, and, and you've just, and you're, you know, you're down to about that much in the, your jar, now it's time to make new. Okay. So you can keep using that yogurt you have until, I would say, until it's not getting thick on its own. Now, so, some of the natural, those natural bacterias maybe are not working. So then you have to go out and buy another thing of yogurt. So that's how I do it. Now, this is the other thing that can be used. And I use this for sou uh, sourdough also. But this is, a, it's called a Brood and Taylor. It's a proofer. And it's electric. It'll, it'll um, the temperature will range everywhere from 70 to 190. So you can make sourdough, which means 75 to 85 degrees. You can make yogurt in it, which is about 110. This thing I find runs just a little hot, so about 100 degrees in mine anyway. It's like any oven. You've got to check it. Um, and it'll also do slow cooking because it'll go up to 190 degrees. But um, so you can use this. And if you look on the internet and in books, they'll give you all kinds of different ways. Try them. One may not work as well for you as another one does. But um, this was a, a godsend, the cooler, till I got bought this. This was just great. It works perfect every single time. So. So that's yogurt. Then I do yogurt cheese. And see, we still got a little whey coming off of it. So um, it's like cream cheese, but it's a little more tart. Cream cheese is sweet, where yogurt cheese is tart, like yogurt is. But you can use it. I've used it in dips. I've used it for all kinds of different things, spreads, all that stuff. It's very handy, so, um, and, and this can be sampled also. Pass around? Yeah. And then, Pass around the spoon. <laughs> <laughs> and then this is the way that comes off of it. So this is how you make yogurt cheese. 
you take a colander and a bowl. Now this one just happens to go together. If you do in a small amount, this works perfect. Um, I also have a big Tupperware bowl that has its own colander that I use quite often because it'll do a lot at one time. But anyway, you just line this with cheesecloth. Cheesecloth, thank you. It was like it wasn't in my head. <laughs> with cheesecloth, um, I put two layers in this, one going this way, one going that. Pour the yogurt in. You can also do the same thing with milk kefir, though you'll get more whey. And pour the yogurt in, then use what's hanging out to cover up. Put a plate on top and some, some sort of weight that will weight it down. And before you know it, this will be filled with whey and you'll and this will have the yogurt cheese in it. So, does that make sense? Is your colander resting up higher than your bowl? So it yes, has yes, you do have to, to have that. Yeah. yeah. How long will it keep? The um, you know, yogurt lasts very long time in your refrigerator. Um, probably a couple months or more, and the cheese will last even longer. Um, and. You want to keep it covered, you know, um, and whey will last six months or more. Are there any ways it, should, it shouldn't look or shouldn't smell? It shouldn't smell rotten. Okay. What if it smells like a little bit like beer? That would be okay. I did a, I did a yogurt and it smelled, it looked kind of, it was a bit beery. I, I, I would guess that would, I've never had one smell like beer, but I don't know. Do you make yogurt? No, I've never all? tried yeah. it. Yeah, so I'd, I've never heard of that before. I, I'd have to see it and smell it myself. Could it have been what you had? Did you, was it something that you made beer in before? I was keeping it in a cabinet next to some kombucha. Well, maybe so that. Was, so I thought maybe. You know. Transfer of yeast. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. That's yeah. what I was just, because they can do that. So, you know, if you do a whole lot of different fermenting all in the same place, you can. And not that that's a terrible, bad thing. I was going to say, you might have something something started there. That's right. <laughs> you might have a really good idea. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, I, I think the other thing, while we're right here and I'm talking about this, uh, and most of your fermenting, you don't want to use metal. Now, i got to be careful because I notice she has all her metal lids. So... <laughs> But um, I try never to use metal um, in any kind of fermenting because it's high acid. Let's remember, any fermented food <coughs> is high acid. So metal doesn't do real well with that kind of environment. And I found that out, I ended up having to throw away, what was it, sweetie? I had a whole bunch of stuff that I had fermented, put metal lids on it. We ended up having to throw them all away because literally, they had rusted to the jar, and I couldn't open them. And so, don't be careful. <laughs> so, so buy the plastic mason jar lids and don't follow my example. Yeah. <laughs> Either that or, you know, I know an awful lot of people who put plastic yeah. underneath, and then, and yeah. you can do that, then, then you don't have that metal. It's not really going to hurt the ferment any, particularly. Mm -hmm. It, it just makes it hard to open, and oh. and uh, it looks really yucky. So, so what do you do with the whey? The whey, whey is wonderful for all kinds of things. And uh, I'll be talking about one thing in particular in a little bit, but um, you can add it to soups. You can add, you can drink it. Um, I there's a <laughs> recipe in one of those books back there that you take water and whey and lemon juice and you've got yourself a nice healthy drink. It's very healthy like every other ferment. Lots of good vitamins and minerals. Whey has a large amount of protein, believe it or not, good protein. So um, it's, it is really good for you. And so I wouldn't throw it down the sink. I would use it. And if you like to make your own soups, throw a little in. I wouldn't put it in at the beginning because you don't want to kill it all off. I would put it in just before you're ready to serve it. 
it's warm, you've turned it off, you put it in, you serve it. What do you mean kill it all off? Well, because there's, it's, it's alive. That whey is alive, just like the yogurt is alive. If it's not alive, it's not near as good for you. And so if you kill off everything, well, now you've just got more dead food. And, and that's okay, there's, certain, there's still a certain amount of vitamins and minerals in it, but that part of what makes ferment healthy is the bacteria for your gut. Okay, and most of, I'm going to guess most of us in this room have had antibiotics in our lifetime. And it kills off the bad as well as the good. Where ferments will have, help put that bacteria back. Because we cannot digest food without gut bacteria. Um, I have put whey in smoothies. Yes which is another great way to use it up. Mm -hmm. And you can use it in bread recipes, yep. I believe. I believe so. You can use it as a partial starter for yeah. vegetable fermenting as well. Yeah, that's I've why I said tried, I would. I've never tried, but yeah, well, I, I've read that's about funny. it. Yeah, that, and that's how I've done my vegetables, so we'll talk about that. Yeah. So, um, Should we pass is that me? Out? Yeah, that pretty much takes care of that. Okay. Hopefully I counted right. I'm not sure if I did. Yogurt? Would he like some? This is the yogurt. Well, this is the yogurt. I have some. Oh! Yeah, I'll let him have it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> See, everyone who sat in the back should have sat in the front. <laughs> <laughs> and then that way we'll have some, you can use them for other things. You can give me one without a spoon. <laughs> oh, perfect. Just save the plastic. Okay. Well, here's one without a spoon. Okay. Who said no spoon? Okay. Does anyone else want to drink one? It's thicker than a pot. It is thick, isn't it? Um, Kara, 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 that might be about it. No. I'm not letting them try the tea yet because it's got caffeine in it. Mm -hmm. um, you can make kombucha decaffeinated if you want. Right. So if your kids like the taste of tea um, and they like fizzy drinks, it might be a good thing to try with kids. Right. And, and yogurt, um, it, you know, I use it oftentimes and I, I do have a sweet tooth, a, a terrible sweet tooth. And so I use jam or jelly in it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I'll tell you what, if you buy jam or jelly that isn't full of uh, corn syrup and that kind of stuff, it's not too bad. And, it, and it's certainly better than what you buy in the store that has fruit in it. Or you can add a little honey or a little maple syrup and that will sweeten it up just a little bit. My son will eat it with if you put in blueberries or strawberries. Yes, exactly, and it, and that's very good too. Uh, that's right. If you if you eat granola, I use I make a smoothie that has fruit, um, raw egg that I don't buy at the store, um, and yogurt and kefir, and and so I'm getting all of those good probiotics. Ah, oh, lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so what's next? Does anyone need a spoon? <coughs> no. Okay. You want a spoon? Oh, he needs a spoon. 
Can he? Better use those spoons. I went and got them. So. This one was it. Plus, the earlier oh, you yeah, start giving your kids now. letting them taste, the mm -hmm. earlier you start. Yeah. yeah. The more likely they will right. develop the palate that recognizes the flavor. Okay, keeper is the next thing on the list. Now, um, we were talking about how it's pronounced. <laughs> and I've always called it keeper, and I'm always told I'm wrong. It's keeper. Kefir. 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 But then she found out that no, in America it is called kefir and that's okay. Good. Well, that's according to one internet source. Well, that's Depending good enough for me. I'll, I even if it's Wikipedia, I'll, I'll take that. <laughs> so, basically, milk kefir is like yogurt, only liquid. Now, if you let it sit with the kefir grains in it, and I'll, I'll pass some of those around, with the kefir grains in it, um, it will get thicker, okay? But you have to leave it in for a long time. This kefir is wonderful. It's so easy to make. You put milk into a jar. Now there's just a couple of kefir grains in here and I'll pass this around and you're welcome to touch them, okay? Because I'll, I'll just throw this away, so don't worry about it. But um, you'll put the kefir grains in, give it a little shake, set it on the counter. How many grains? Um, it'll probably be about a tablespoon that you'll want to go in to whatever. And if, it's, if you use a half gallon jar, you'll want a few more than that. Um, but, but really, this little amount will sour this. In fact, the last time I made it, I left it sitting on the counter too long and literally it almost got as solid as the yogurt. Not quite, but almost. So it will do a lot. But you put that in, shake it, you know, let it sit there for a few hours or overnight. Huh? I did four days once made yogurt. Yeah, yeah, there we go. That'll do it. Four days, she said. So you can do that too. But see, you don't ha you don't need any fancy equipment. You don't need to heat it up. You don't need to do anything. You put these little guys, and they do everything. This, you'll see on your notes, these, and she'll be talking about it for kombucha also, is called a SCOBY. SCOBY stands for a symbiotic community of bacteria and yeast. So here is the kefir greens. Now that's for milk. And then when you're done, you strain it. Take the key take the kefir grains, put it in some more milk. Drink this. <laughs> My kitty loves this. Yeah. Gus loves it. Huh? Yeah, healthy cat. Yes, he loves that stuff. Um this here, this is water kefir, and it's water, sugar, and kefir grains. It sours just a little. It doesn't get real sour, but it does sour just a little. I then added um, some, um, what were you talking about? No, 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 we were just talking about it. Sorghum. Sorghum, thank you, thank you. Then I put sorghum in it to kind of give it a flavor. If you let this sit, and if you, if you put it like into a soda bottle, beer bottle, wine bottle, it will actually get fizzy, okay? So this is what, and you're welcome to touch this too. I, I, this will go in the trash when I'm done, so don't you worry about it if you wanna look at it. So, um, but both of these have Simil similar bacteria and yeast. Um, some people use this like soda pop, kind of like what people do with kombucha. So, where do you get this kefir stuff? Um, you can buy it on the internet. That's what I forgot to do. Is bring the the different. Um, there's there's at least two. One is called Kombucha Mama, and she has kefir grains as well as kombucha. Um, Gem Cultures is one. Yeah, yeah, she has. She also has some of those. J E M 
cultures. Yeah. Does Basics have it? Yes, yes, I do believe they do have. They have the water kefir grains, but not milk kefir grains. And, they, and you can't mm -hmm. use them interchangeable. interchangeable. Unfortunately, no, and I'm not sure why. How do you store them when you're not using them? Um, you can just put them in a, in a little milk or a little water, depending. Um, w if you put them in a little water, you want to put a little sugar in them and um, put them in the refrigerator. And they'll stay there for probably several weeks. And the peas have water on them? No, no. not at the moment. Well, they probably have a little leftover water, but yeah, I didn't. I just brought them the way they were. Yeah. Um, let's say I was I went into basics and saw hey that, there's a sorry to be late. Okay, what was that again? I'm sorry. Um, so they don't have you said they don't have the milk milk uh, uh, kefir grains at basics. But let's say I bought a bottle of kefir. Mm -hmm. Could I just do the similar thing that you talked about with the yogurt? Just adding yogurt in to start a kefir culture? Could I add like no? A half cup of kefir. No. Um, kefir and yogurt are going to have different bacteria and yeast. But you, you couldn't okay. start a ferment based off of um, like. Yeah. Well, I, may, the may, kefir. I'm you, not sure. Could you start kefir? Um, so your question, I think, is: Can you start kefir scobies from a bottle of kefir you bought at the store? Yes. I, think so. I don't know the answer. No. Um, I do sure. know that you can you can build your own scoby for kombucha. So yeah. my guess is you maybe can, can build your own scobies for kefir. I don't know how it's done. I would think that it would be like vinegar. If you you will end up if you make your own vinegar and if you let it set long enough, it will it will make its own mother, which is a scoby like what key is used for kefir okay but it has to sit a very long time a very long time and, but i'm not sure of the process i'd worry about making sure that it all kept fed and how yeah. how that was actually done so and i'm not sure does it increase with each use does, I yes it does it does yes so it does apply it with each mm -hmm. use so you'll have more yes next time yes yeah, it, it, it's and it does. It it does mult. I mean, it, so, some of us remember wire hangers and how they used to multiply in your closet, right? Right. Well, that's what kefir grains do. Water kefir is pretty much the same. It sits on the counter. Water kefir has to sit longer. Usually, you do that three or four days, instead of a few hours. Which is still a shorter ferment yes. process than kombucha. Yes, it is. Very so, much so. I mean, these look very similar. They do. Um, this didn't until I added the, yeah. The, it, it, it was much lighter. It kind of gets cloudy, but it was much lighter than this until I added the sorghum. The sorghum. So. Kombucha is about a week, right? Um, it, at least. Yeah. I'd say at least. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I, I'll put a plug in for, for books about fermentation where you will find recipes. So yes. even if, so don't worry too much about even writing down quantities that we might have used in these. Right. Um, I don't know about you, but I'm always consulting a book for a always. recipe because I can't, I don't always remember the quantities I'm supposed to be using. I even make them up and write them on <laughs> little pieces of paper and say to myself, oh, it came out good. Fantastic, I'll use it next time. <laughs> um, that is for sure. Yeah, but I bet a book would be a great resource to find out the answer to your question. Can you create your own kefir scobies? I bet a book would tell you yeah, how to do it. You know, right. Yeah. Didn't have the internet handy. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, but, and, but we do have books here, here at Hedberg, and then also in the greater um, cataloging system that we have that covers 13 libraries is it something like yeah. that that you that they can be brought in sometimes within a few days and sometimes not so so quick right yeah. <laughs> I think there's a lot of holds on this. probably <laughs> probably so um, so anyway I think the next thing is veggies do you want to do we want to do any kefir tasting oh should we, we um, could um, 
These are all drinkable, so. So do we need a separate drink? If anyone's willing to reuse their cup for everything, yes. please do. Yeah. Well, it's in the same dairy family. It shouldn't be too bad. Just form a line. Just do it like this. Yeah. All right, if you, I'll pour if you want to talk about carrots. Okay. And your other things there. So a couple of, I guess I, I wrote down a couple of just basic tips too to start off with. Um, these are tips for really any fermenting project you're doing, whether it's dairy or vegetables or a liquid of some kind. Um, you want to always be using food safe equipment, right? Okay. So. Um, we talked about maybe not using metal, so again, don't look at my bad example here. But notice that we're using glass. Most of our vessels are glass um, or ceramic. Uh, you can use plastic, but it should be food grade plastic. So you, you can buy the big food grade five gallon buckets and you can do a big vat of sauerkraut in that and everything will be just fine. It can be hard to find um, especially, uh, um, it can be hard to find a, an economically uh, less expensive crock that will hold a lot of veggies. This, uh, this one actually is pretty big, but I'm, I'm sure many of you have seen those antique ones that are, you know, they're this big around. Um, a lot of us can't afford to buy those. Um, but there are other options, but definitely you, you want to you wanna just try to use glass or ceramic if you can and avoid plastic if you can. I agree. <laughs> um, another general tip would be to practice in small batches, okay? So don't start by making a big thing like this um, or an even bigger five gallon plastic bucket. You know, start with making a quart size sample of something or I mean, these are probably slightly more than a quart that she was using or she was talking about half gallon. You don't need to start big, start small, get the hang of the process, um, and then you can you know, increase the amount you're making at the same time after you've had some practice. You always wanna be packing, especially for vegetables, you wanna pack things as full as you can get it. So, I mean, these jars of veggies are extremely full. They're about as full as I can get them. So that's a good tip to always follow. Um, the reason for that is the more space you have between where the, where the, what you're fermenting stops and the top of the vessel, the more likely you are to have some kind of um, airborne contamination which in general is not too common if you're fermenting, but it's, it does happen. You can have some molds develop on top of your ferment while it's processing, and most of the time you can just scrape those off and move on and not worry about them. But to limit the, um, the chance of that happening, you always wanna pack as tight and as full as you can, okay? That's similar to canning for those of you who can, you always wanna pack pretty close to the top um, and also you want to think clean but not sterile okay so canning is a sterile process you are killing everything associated with contaminating possible contamination of what you what what you're putting in your hot water um, steam or boiling canner with fermentation you don't have to sterilize everything to death your 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 equipment you don't have to sterilize it to death just make sure it's clean. Hot soapy water is all you need to wash your stuff and prepare your equipment to doing ferment to preparing your equipment to do fermentation. Would you agree with that? I would. Okay. So those are some just little tidbits. Sure. Part part of the reason is because um, the bacteria that is part of of each one of these ferments literally helps kill off the bad bacteria. Yes. So I, I think it's good to remember that bacteria is everywhere. In fact, they think that over half of our weight is bacteria inside and outside of us. The largest majority of bacteria that we deal with outside our bodies, inside, 
are benign. They, they're just there. They won't hurt us, they won't help us. The next size portion are beneficial bacteria. There's really a very small portion of the bacteria world that's harmful. Not saying that it's not harmful, because it can be very harmful. But you don't have to, germs are not really to be afraid of. Especially in fermentation. Yeah, exactly. Do you exactly. have a question? Uh, do you use tap water or filtered water in there? The, the, guide, the guidance is to use filtered water. Mm -hmm. You especially want to make sure the chlorine's out of it. Mm -hmm. So if you have to use tap water, uh, set it out a day or two before and the chlorine will dissipate on its own. I think you can use distilled water, yes. but I think that also, I think distilled, what I've read is can strip some other benefits right. that are in the water. Um, so if you have access to well water or if you can leave your tap water sitting out, that should be fine. Okay, so let's talk about vegetable fermenting. Um, fermenting vegetables follows a basic process. So the first thing you do is somehow cut up your vegetables. And you can kind of chop them coarsely. Uh, you can slice them like these jalapenos. Um, or you can grate them like these carrots. Um, and certain vegetables you may prefer um, one way or the other with the carrots. I definitely prefer the grating, um, but I'm also lazy and I use my food processor to grate them with my processing attachment. I do not stand there with my little <laughs> carrot, grate, my little grater and go up and down with all my carrots. Because even just to make about three or four of these size, it can take a two pound bag of carrots because of how tightly you're gonna end up packing in. And I don't have enough time in my life to grate, can grate two pounds of carrots. Um, you will always, so after you get them chopped the way you want, that's when you pack them tightly into a vessel. You're either gonna be submerging them in a brine, which is salt water, or you're gonna be incorporating salt into the vegetables before you pack them and massaging the salt into the vegetables and then pounding them down or packing them down with some kind of, um, I don't know, you can use your fist, you can use something like this, but you're basically squishing the vegetables and squeezing out the brine that is naturally being created by the vegetables mixed with the salt. Um, <clears throat> you do not need to put any kind of other starter. There's no SCOBY involved in vegetable fermenting. You can use whey if you want, so you can pour a little bit of this into um, the start of a vegetable ferment, but you don't have to. I've never tried it. My understanding is that it just makes the ferment go a little faster. Right. It kind of just jump starts it, because there's already a lot of probiotics in this liquid to start with. Um, then once you're packed, you're chopped, you're packed, you've got salt in there, you've got brine, then you set it on the counter, leave it at room temperature, and then you just gotta wait. And how long you wait really varies by recipe. It varies by season of the year. It varies by the temperature of your house. Yes. A ferment in my house probably takes longer than it does in, no, it takes longer in Maureen's house than it does in mine because she keeps her house extremely cold. I do. And my house is warmer, so my ferments are going to go faster probably than hers do. Um, I would say most of the time you want to, the, the best way to check if your ferment is to your liking is to just open up the thing and taste it. So you can, you're not going to damage it. If you open up the vessel, stick a clean fork in it, take a taste. If you like how it tastes and you think it's done, you're done. If you want it to go longer, let it go longer. It kind of depends on how sour or how tangy or how bright you want the flavors to be in your vegetables. Um, you have a question? Do you have to put a weight? Or anything in these? Um, you do need to do a weight, yeah. So I'll kind of walk through specifically what I did for oh. this one. Um, but just in general for okay. now, I'm just saying cut the vegetables, get the salt in there, create the brine, cover it up, set it on the counter, let it sit, taste it. When you're done, 
when you like the taste, put it in a cooler environment to live out the rest of its life as you're eating it. And I almost always put it in my fridge. Um, I don't have a root cellar. If you have a root cellar, if you happen to be lucky to have a root cellar, you can store your completed fermented vegetables in a root cellar. Or if, if you have an unheated basement. Yeah, that's possible. For kombucha, I have a little, I have like a wine refrigerator that I don't put wine in, I put kombucha in it. Um, and it's cool enough that, it's, that it slows the fermentation way down. Doesn't stop it entirely. Um, but definitely while you're consuming it, um, you want it to be kept relatively cool at that point. Um, so we keep talking about the good and the bad bacteria. I do have kind of a scientific explanation for what's going on. Are you guys interested in hearing that? Sure. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so here's the science behind vegetable fermenting. Um, the process is called lacto-fermentation. The bacteria that are naturally present on the vegetables and primarily on the skins of the vegetables those bacteria are salt tolerant. So when you add the salt, those friendly bacteria that are salt tolerant, they begin to replace the bad bacteria that are not salt tolerant. So you're building up a kind of a salty environment and it's creating lactic acid. As those bad bacteria, I'm sorry, as the good bacteria are, are persisting in the salty environment, they are, they are taking the place of the bad bacteria and in that process are creating lactic acid. And that's how your environment becomes a very acidic environment. Um, over a short period of time, the acidic environment prevents further intrusion by bad bacteria and gives your vegetables a sour or a tangy flavor. And those friendly bacteria that end up persisting in here, you sometimes hear those referred to as probiotics. Does that make sense? Um, okay, so we talked about filtered water, skins on. So yeah, don't peel the stuff to ferment it. Just wash it pretty well. Keep the skins on. That's where a lot of the, the wild bacteria are coming from to help this process. Um, it is okay to, let's say that you've, um, you've packed this down as far as you think you can pack it down and you really don't feel like there's enough brine because the liquid is not covering the vegetables. It is okay to make a separate batch of brine and pour it over the top to make sure the veggies are totally submerged in the liquid. That's very important. So don't be, I have to do it all the time. I don't know if I just don't, I just don't have enough height above my counter yes. to, <laughs> you know, pack it down tight enough to get all of the liquid squeezed out. But if you feel like you're low on liquid, you can just make a separate concoction of salt water and pour it over the top. How much salt do you use? Um, there is a formula for it. Yeah. I think it's one tablespoon per cup. I, I don't remember. I always have to look it up. Yeah, I have to look it up. It's, you know. it's <laughs> just look. There's so many places you can look it up. It isn't even funny. And you know, if you don't, if you don't, if you don't have the internet in front of you, and you don't have a book, call the library. Yeah, the reference librarians. The would reference it out librarians would love to look that up. They'd for look you. it up for me. You bet they yeah, would. would. You they bet would. they would. All right, so specifically how I made this recipe right here, this is um, ginger, this is carrot ginger, I call it carrot ginger kraut. I think it has other names. Um, but it's just carrots and ginger, and it's really, really good. Um, so I follow, um, I do kind of follow a recipe for it. Again, I pointed this out earlier. I tried it once, four pounds of carrots, eight tablespoons of, eight teaspoons of salt, four tablespoons of freshly ground ginger. And it worked well, I liked the taste, so I kind of keep using this. I also have cut this in half and done it that way, just using two pounds of carrots. Um, but you can, again, consult a book that has a carrot kraut or a ginger carrot something recipe in it, and you may see a different combination of measurements to try. 
Um, <clears throat> so I did grate it with my food processor. Um, I, put this, I put the grated carrots in a bowl. I added the salt, I added the ginger, and I just massaged it with my fingers, just probably for two minutes or less. Didn't take very long at all. You start to see liquid forming in the bottom of the bowl, and that's the start of the brine. So the salt is working its magic with the carrots. As soon as you see the brine starting to form, you can transfer that mixture from a bowl into a vessel. And you can put it straight into a mason jar. Um, the last batch I did, I did in about this size of a crock. Do you want to pass this around? Um, and then, um, like I said, if I didn't feel like I had enough brine in there, I added some brine. And then I did weight it down. So in that particular vessel, what I did was I um, filled a Ziploc, um, a gallon-sized Ziploc bag with maybe only, I filled it maybe a quarter of the way up with water, and I stuck the weighted water bag on top of the submerged vegetables, and that was enough to weight the vegetables down to make sure the liquid was always on the top of the shredded carrots. So nothing fancy, just a weighted Ziploc, uh, just a Ziploc bag weighted with water. If you have the right size like plate, if you have a plate in your cupboard that fits snugly inside of the wide mouth of a crock, you can use a plate to weight the vegetables down. Um, this particular crock right here, which was a gift to me from somebody, comes with its own set of ceramic weights that you can put inside the vessel to weight the vegetables down. Um, other things you can do, not necessarily to weight down, but you can use large cabbage leaves and lay those on top of vegetables to make sure that um, the vegetable you're actually fermenting, so in this case, carrot, if I had used carrots, the cabbage leaves could sit on top of the carrots, kind of help weight them down, and kind of have a, serve as a barrier between the submerged carrots and the top of the vessel. You can so you also you use a bag. A I've heard of using a rock. If you want to go out and get a good rock, mm -hmm. wash them really good, put it you on. Use a rock. You know, um, you can even. You can um, use a jar filled yeah. with water. Right. And you can use um, a bag inside of mason jars, too. With yes, water you can out. use. I've used a, um, a much smaller, like a sandwich size mm -hmm. Ziploc bag and put water in it and, and um, laid that in the vessel because mm -hmm. um, one thing is that you don't want to totally cut off the air right. flow into a ferment because that's part of the process so you don't really you don't want to cover it like this when it's fermenting this is just covered like this when it's all done to be stored in the refrigerator um, you need to have a little bit of air exposure but you don't want the veggies to become unsubmerged and you don't want fruit flies in there and other flies and you don't want dust to get in there. So that's why you just need to weight it down and just kind of provide sort of a, it's, kind of, it's almost like a seal, a little bit of a seal. Cheesecloth? You could use, yeah, you could use cheesecloth, maybe even like cheesecloth um, draped over like this um, saran wrap is with a rubber band around it, that would work. I, I use that method for the kombucha. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Let's talk a little bit about the tasting. So I mentioned that you kind of just need to get a feel for the flavor that you like. So give your ferments at least a week, especially if it's a vegetable that kind of has a tough, like kind of has a tough skin to it. You definitely want to give it about a week open it up, taste it. If you like it, you're done. You can, in the case of that crock back there, when I liked the taste of the carrots that was in the crock I used, all I did at that point was transfer um, the carrots that were in that crock into individual um, containers of this size because I can't fit that crock in my fridge. You could eat the ferment right out of the crock 
people do that, especially people who have a cool place to store it, like a root cellar or a really cold basement. You can put your five gallon bucket of sauerkraut down in the basement, walk down, take a scoop, eat it. Well, you can, <laughs> you can dig some out. You just want to make sure that you recover it and um and get it submerged again that's that's yeah. really the the main thing um just a little story i i love telling this story captain cook who of course sailed around the world he's famous for that and he didn't he didn't he didn't he discover uh, hawaiian islands and alaska i believe but um, when he started out, they took on X, X amount of kegs of sauerkraut, okay? And they were gone for over two years. And when they were within just a few days of getting home, they stopped at some place, an island or something, and they offloaded the last two barrels of sauerkraut and gave to whoever was there. So that sauerkraut, lived on a ship in the ocean where it was possibly hot, possibly cold, sea water, sea air, and it was good over two years later. Ferments are wonderful things. It's really, really difficult to ruin them. Yes, it is. Very difficult to ruin them. And another another plug for having a, a book around would be to, to so a lot of the, the books about fermentation have photos of things that you should look for mm -hmm. if you notice something funky going on in your fermentation. There are photos of the bad molds to look for, the bad kinds of molds. There are also photos of um, cloudiness. That's totally fine. Right. There's photos of molds that are totally fine that you can just scrape off and then move on with continuing to eat them. Not the molds, the veggies underneath the molds. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that's another, another way that um, books are useful. So maybe having one around your kitchen would be, would be helpful. No. Should we taste? Do you have questions about the carrots? What was, it was four pounds of carrots. I did eight teaspoons of salt, four tablespoons of ginger. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, I've, there's, there are a couple different versions of ginger carrots in the books back there. Okay. So, I don't know if anyone wants to use their cup they can. Well, well, we'll start there. Um, I'll have, while you're doing that, I will quickly, Okay. I brought a couple other ferments that I've tried. Um, this one is zucchini and summer squash. So you guys in the back mentioned that you have a CSA. Um, I also do, and I get at times during the CSA season, I feel overwhelmed by mm -hmm. the amount of vegetables I'm getting. Um, so I do a combination of freezing, canning, fermenting, but this is an example of a week where I had, I don't know, maybe six or seven zucchini and summer squash, and I was like, I'm never going to eat these before they spoil. Um, so I decided to make a kind of a summer squash ferment, and it called for a kind of a chili a chili pepper that I didn't have, so I put in a whole bunch of red pepper flakes, and it is super spicy. <laughs> um, but it's good, but it is really spicy. So if you want to taste that, you can, although I have already dipped into it, so maybe you might think that you may, you may not want to taste it. Um, this, is just, um, this is just a quick ferment of, um, I think it's primarily jalapenos. So again, I got a lot of jalapenos in my CSA. So I just sliced them up. I put some garlic in here, some red pepper, maybe some other seasonings down at the bottom. I can't quite remember. So I put the seasonings down at the bottom. I sliced the peppers. I packed the peppers in here pretty tight, not as tight as I had to pack these. And then I made a brine and poured the brine right over the slices. I did not put salt on the peppers themselves and massage it in this case. 
one reason is I didn't want to massage pepper, jalapenos with my fingers. Um, but even still, I think jalapenos, um, you know, you see this stuff in the store all the time in the olive aisle, all these little condiments of peppers and cauliflower mixed together, and it just kind of looks cool this way, so that's why I chose to do it this way. Um, but yeah, so you're either, you basically kind of have two choices, then you can massage the salt in and create the brine so it sits in its own brine or you can just slice the vegetables put them in the jar and pour the brine over the top so here you get a lot more liquid here you get a lot more vegetable what would be the, the, an instance in which you would decide to can something instead of fermented considering some of the troubles you run um, when you I don't flavor. know about fermenting, <laughs> uh, really, when you don't understand how long ferment, fermented things can last, I think, I, I suppose if you want it to, to last many years, you could can it, but even then, you don't want to keep canned foods for that long either. So maybe storage space, yeah. maybe if you don't have a cool, cool place, place to store. Yeah a lot of fermented foods but you have a lot of pantry space so when once you've canned it it'll keep that tart flavor that sharp flavor that that fermented things will have it just won't have the added benefits and then you had I have yes I have here um, garlic and you're welcome I, I, what I might do is just let you come up afterwards and I'll give you some if you want some, okay? And it's just cloves of garlic. And now, the way I ferment, because I'm lazy and I only have so much time, I inoculate almost all my vegetables anymore because it's so much easier. Um, I, and what you do is besides the salt and the water, you add a little whey and that is your inoculant. It already has all that bacteria, you don't have to worry about it. You throw it in there and you let it set and now it's fermented. And garlic is, I, I use this in cooking, I use this fresh, I use it every way you can imagine. And it does, um, even though it, it has that fermented kind of flavor, kind of, it's not hot. As quite as you can literally eat a clove of garlic without it burning your tongue like garlic can do it's it's quite tasty I love it so I always try to keep some around the house um, and this is um, fermented le uh, lemons and I use this in cooking all the time it kind of gives like a little Greek flavor to something you're cooking you know you put that and again I am not this you you do the same as you do with the vegetables the salt and 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 of course all those lemons are going to juice up and you use all that lemon juice um, but you can add water to it what what I find the reason I have to add brine mm -hmm. um, is because if I get it too close to the top and it bubbles up really good it will bubble over yes it will so make sure you put a, something underneath it i do this a lot in my pantry yeah in case it bubbles over yeah yeah so you know th think about that towels anything that will kind of catch it because it will it can get kind of messy sometimes and if you've got a whole bunch of jars at one time it will get icky and um, and then just over time, I, these, these black seals or ball jar seals, they, they are not for canning, but they don't leak. These white ones will leak terribly. You shake it and you got moisture all over the place. And so the moisture evaporates after a while. And so when I pulled these out, I pulled out another jar and it was bone dry so it went into the trash unfortunately once a ferment goes completely dry you might be able to keep it 
but I just didn't want to take a chance. I don't know how long it was in there dry, so I just, it didn't smell bad, it smelled fine, but I just didn't want to take a chance, so it went in the trash. Um, but but I, I love the lemons too, so that that's what I do. I, I inoculate almost all of mine. I did make a crock, oh, this has been quite a few years ago, and, and I have like a, a 10 gallon crock, it's not a huge one, but it's, you know, fair size, and I layered it with every kind of veggie you can imagine, and with the brine, and and it was delicious. It was so good, um, but it takes a lot longer. This is done in three days, for the most part. So, like I said, being being a touch on the lazy side, and you're welcome to try either one of these. I'm not sure that we want to pass them around right no, now. No. That's, we need to do our beets and... Right. Is that where we're at now? Beet so. kvass. Okay, that's this stuff here. Beet kvass is very good for you. First of all, you know beets are excellent for you. How many people like beets? Oh, I'm so glad to hear. Here, yes, beets are so good for you. Um, oftentimes, I like to add ginger, turmeric, and garlic to this because, oh, that just really... Um, but this, this one only has beets. Now, I did bring this just so you could see. This is what the beets look like after they've soaked in the brine. I'll let you pass that around. There's not, though you can use them a second time, it won't get this dark. Um, those won't be used. Those will be thrown away at this point. But um, it, again, like any fermented vegetable, it's water, salt, and a vegetable. I will tell you that with beets, because they're so high in sugar, you don't want to grate them. That's the one vegetable you never want to grate because then you'll have beet wine. <laughs> or beet vinegar, one of the two. So you don't want to grate them, you want to cut them off. I've cut them up bigger than that and they've worked great, or you can cut them up a little smaller. So, um, but beet kvass, besides having all those good probiotics, all the other good, great reasons to do a ferment, um, they've got the beets, and beets are what? They help lower blood pressure, they're supposed to be good for your heart, they're supposed to be good for all kinds of good things, and so it's just a great way. I, I've read several things that say, Four ounces in the morning, four ounces at night, you'll live to be 203. So you're just, you're just steeping the beets in the water? That's it. Yeah, and it's about a three-day process. Oh, well, and, and this is a, this one is, I also inoculated this with the whey. Um, you don't have to. You don't have to. You can just let it set, and it will do its thing. It's kind of like compost. And in a way, this fermenting is a regulated compost because compost is making things rot and believe it or not that's we hate I hate to say it but that's what you're doing you're partially digesting yes these before you even consume them exactly can you do beets something like that a little thicker than that instead of a big one yes yeah you can do a small I just mean the consist the no less liquid no, the idea, well, yes, you can if you want the vegetable. Mm -hmm. I want the kvass. Okay. Kvass itself is a drink. Okay. And so, um, but, but yeah. You can, you can pickle beets. You can do a quick ferment, ferment. of beets um, where you would maybe slice them. Slice them. Mm -hmm. or, or rough chop them. Right. Yeah. But, but kvass itself is a, is a drink. So... Um, what did you, did you put hot water in those beets? No, no, just regular water. I mean, make it as room temperature as possible. You don't want cold water either, but you don't have to use hot water with this. Um, in fact, with most ferments, you want to use room temperature water. Is there any that don't use room temperature? I've always, I've always seen room temperature. Yeah, I, I can't think if there's any, but um, yeah, I don't know of... Yogurt is one of the few things that you actually heat. There, there isn't very much else that you heat. 
So, so you just put the beads, pour the water over it, and some salt. It's salt, and and then your inoculant if you want it. Okay. Yeah, and um, um, I put the lid on it. You can put cheesecloth over it. Really, it's kind of six one half dozen to the other. Now she says that she always makes sure there's room for air, but some some ferments you don't have to do that. That that's why uh, this we envision this as a real starter to get you uh, thinking about it, and then go to the books that have all of the information written down because there was just no way we could give you exact recipes for all of these things because it's already out there it's already out there um <coughs> you want to hand me a cup of that uh, a water cup and i will put some of that kvass in there and pass it around and i think with with maureen's ferments when she, vegetable ferments when she's using the inoculant which is the way um, again, her ferments are taking less time than right. they would if she wasn't adding this at the beginning. Correct. So that's where, again, I would say give everything at least a week, especially if you're not using a starter culture of some kind. Right. Okay. Kombucha? Kombucha is the next. Okay. <coughs> All right. I've got some kombucha up here. Um, I'm going to pass this one around. Because it actually has a little floater scoby in it that's trying to grow. Yeah, I was going to say that's the biggest problem. If it drips, we're in trouble. So um, sometimes the fermentation is not entirely done, even when you put it away and you expect to drink it soon. So this particular um, jar of kombucha I have has a little, a little scoby starting. You can see it floating in here. It looks a little bit like an alien floating in your drink. It's perfectly it's so safe cute. to drink. If you accidentally drink this whole jar down and it goes down your throat, you will live, I promise. Because I've done it several times. <laughs> All right, so kombucha, kind of like the water keeper, requires a scoby, but you're using brewed, usually black or green tea. What is kombucha? Kombucha is um, a fermented tea. So, yep, so and it looks a little bit like this. Um, I, before you came in tonight, um, Maureen talked about water keeper, which is this one which just uses a different culture to start it and doesn't use tea. It's just water and the scoby, which are the kefir grains. Um, kombucha is, there is, there is brewed tea in here, yes. Yep, kombucha as compared to kefir is brewed tea mixed with water and sugar and a scoby, okay? And I am going to, that needs to be green and black tea, right? It green should be green and black. Green or black tea, I think you can use oolong tea. Um, but there are you are not supposed to use herbal teas. They just don't give you the, the results. Um, I have some scobies in here. Do you want to... May yeah. I walk around with this? I can. <coughs> they look totally disgusting. <laughs> um, and most of these are mother scobies, but that I would say was a baby scoby, okay. the whiter one. Um, <clears throat> so you can smell them. Yep, you can smell mm -hmm. it. Is. It's like having a science experiment on your kitchen counter. And you can <laughs> buy those, start those scobies? You can buy a scoby starter, yes. Um, you can try to grow your own, like I said, or what most people do is if they know somebody who has one, they just ask for one of the babies. Because every time you put a mother scoby in a batch of kombucha to ferment, it's going to start forming a baby scoby. And eventually you'll have two scobies. And then if you keep using those, then you'll have three scobies. And people build scoby hotels, and they have these, they have these, these giant gallon-sized vessels full of tea and like 25 scobies. If you Google scoby hotel, there will be many interesting pictures. Um, 
I did a little like half of an experiment. I'm not done with my experiment. I did dehydrate two scovies mm -hmm. and I'm going to see if I can rehydrate them and they will work. But this is what they look like totally dried up. <laughs> And they have kind of an odor, you know. How long did they go to It took about a day. At a specific temperature? I think I did the lowest temperature on my dehydrator. I think it was 135, possibly. But I don't know if they're going to rehydrate and work. I haven't done that part of the experiment. Uh, but yeah, but basically kombucha is you brew some tea. Again, you want to follow a recipe for the exact amounts, but you're going to brew a little bit of tea and a little bit of water. The particular recipe I use is eight tea bags and four cups of water. I buy really inexpensive Lipton tea bags. So this is very economical. Um, once the tea is brewed, um, I add a cup of sugar and once the sugar tea is cool enough to combine with more water I combine it with more water about 10 more cups of water and then I put my I pour a little bit of starter tea so I would just pour some of this out into my vessel so it's got something to get started because there's lots of bacteria already in here um, or you can buy a bottle of, just buy one bottle of kombucha at the store. Kind of like buying yogurt, a little yogurt to get you started. You can buy a little bottle of kombucha to get you started as your starter tea. And then once your brew tea, your sugar, your sugar, your um, extra water, your starter tea, and um, are all in the vessel together, give it a quick stir. And then you drop in your SCOBY right on top. <laughs> <laughs> Looks kind of like an alien, I've always I know, thought. I know, I know. <laughs> you guys can come touch this stuff at the end if you want. I don't care, you can touch it. Um, so, and then, and then cover it up. Like I said before, I do cheesecloth with a rubber band for my kombucha. I'm usually using a gallon size glass um, mason jar. And then I always let it sit for at least a week I've, I've gone, I think I've gone as long as three weeks, especially in the winter time when fermentation takes longer when it's colder in my house. Um, and then again, just like with the vegetables, I taste it. I stick a, I stick out like one of my kids plastic, one of my kids like water bottle straws. I just stick it all the way down through the SCOBY because the SCOBY is going to kind of float on top of everything and it's going to eventually expand to match the um, circumference of your vessel. So you have to stick the straw in below the SCOBY, suck them out, <laughs> taste it. Do you like it? Is it still too sweet? Let it go longer. If it's too sour, you're just going to have to deal with it. <laughs> and do better next time. <laughs> Like I brought some in for Maureen to taste and she's like, that's a little too sour for my taste. Um, so it really depends on your palate. If you want it to stay a little sugary, then don't go much longer than a week. If you want it to be more sour, you can go much longer with your I, ferment. Let me give you a hint. If you let it go too sour, because that's unfortunately what I have always done. For some reason, I cannot stop at the right spot. I add mine to a little apple juice or something. Mm -hmm. Not lots, mm -hmm. just enough, just to sweeten it up, you know, because I'm so sweet, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so that's what's called the first ferment. Now you have the option of doing a second ferment with kombucha, and you're nodding because you've done it before probably. I've, I've heard about it, it's something that I've got to try. Yeah, I just tried it this time, and so I'll explain that quickly because then I know we still have bread to do. Um, so with, after you're done with the first ferment, so I have my big jar of kombucha, I take, I take the SCOBY out gently, make sure I've washed my hands, lift my SCOBY out, put it in my little SCOBY hotel or wherever I'm storing it, and then, um, and then I just put the kombucha in smaller containers. I almost always use these. You can buy fancy bottles that have the, the you know, the stoppers at the top. And if you do use one of those little fancier bottles and then add a small amount of something with sugar. Like juice. Juice or even or just plain fruit. sugar. Or uh, fresh fruit. You fresh fruit. It. it will get fizzy. 
It'll get fizzier over here. Yeah. If you In fact, didn't we have some explode yeah. one time? Yeah. yeah. It got a little too fizzy. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> what, so what I did for a second ferment this time is I had my first ferment in a jar like this. I added maybe 10% of the size of this of um, some fresh cider I got at my CSA. Ooh, yummy. And I put some cinnamon, some ground cinnamon in it. Oh, yeah. And I let this sit on my counter another three days, opened it up, tasted it. It was a lot more carbonated than it was okay. just three days prior. So that was my second ferment. Yummy. For so I have both here to try. I have the first ferment and I have the second ferment. All right. So I can maybe pour those while you talk about bread. <laughs> sourdough. All right. So the last thing we're kind of going to talk about is sourdough. And I'm going to preface this with none of this stuff is going to taste like what you buy at the store. The kombucha won't taste like what you buy at the store. The kefir won't taste like the yogurt won't. None of this is going to taste like what you buy at the store because what you buy at the store is done in a big machine with way lots more stuff. And so I, I always like to prep any homemade thing, I think tastes better, but it never tastes like what you buy at the store. So with that said, sourdough. Sourdough, any bread you make at home is not gonna taste like what you, bread that you have at the store. It just it doesn't have the same texture. You cannot make Wonder Bread in your kitchen. <laughs> Thank <a> goodness. Good. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I did bring five bags. I don't want no wrestling over them, but you may take the starter home if you wish. <laughs> okay. Anyway, you can see, you can see all the, it, it is still working. You can see all the little bubbles in it. So it's still working very nicely. Um, I did feed this just before I came, got it all nice and warm, and it bubbled up really nice, so, you know. So what did you put in it? Huh? What did you put in it? Okay, sourdough is flour and water. Ta-da! That's pretty much it. Now, I will, I am going to grab two books back here. Now, I have been trying to make sourdough... Sourdough, I've been trying to make sourdough for 20 years. And I've never been able to do it. It's always gone bad on me. And take my word for it, if it goes bad, you'll know it. Because it has a sour smell to it. But when it goes bad, it smells rotten. You know it needs to go in the trash. It smells just like that. So take my word for it, you'll know when it goes bad. And I couldn't figure out what I was doing. And I had all kinds of people give me their starters, and they had the special starter, whatever the case may be. I would do exactly what they said, and it would die on me. Well, come to find out, the reason is, is my house is too cold in the, in the wintertime. And of course, when is it that I have time to do this kind of stuff? The wintertime. I don't have time to try to do something new in the summertime, so I was doing it in the winter, and my house is, uh, we usually keep it at 65, 66. That's pretty warm for us. <laughs> Partially because I'm cheap, I'll admit it, but you know. Um, and that's too cold. That's too cold for almost all ferments. Some things I can put on my stove, which still has all the burner, all the uh, pilot lights. I have a very old stove. I'm going to really cry if I ever have to get rid of it because you can't get those anymore. You can't get stoves with pilot lights anymore. So um, I can sometimes put it in the oven because there's this pilot light in there. and it's. But sourdough, it doesn't work that way because you need all that bacteria that's in the air, all the yeast, not bacteria so much, the yeast that are in the air. So this is the book. I love this book. I have read many books on sourdough and I'm not telling you to buy this or anything. I did ask them to buy it for here you can get it through a different library, but you can um, put it on reserve for here. I did ask them to buy one for here, so hopefully they did. I haven't looked yet. Um, this is my copy. This is the, and if you read through this, it gives you step by step by step of exactly what to do. 
And what she showed me when I, because I just picked this up and thought, oh gosh, I'd love to make sourdough. And so I was reading through it one evening and I thought, well, I'm going to give this a try because it happened to be summer. Guess what? It worked. I made sourdough. And, you know, it was so wonderful. The other thing she said is look into one of these, the proofer. And, and I think this will be my salvation this winter. This will keep my sourdough at 75 to 85 degrees is what you want it. Um, and because in my house it cannot, it won't sustain that. So this is my, this is going to be my salvation. So, um, but basically, now what she says to do to start with, and this is another reason, is you feed it twice a day for a week. And then you do that three more times. Now you have a really good starter. Now you can put it, put that little starter in the refrigerator for a week for when you want it. In fact, it'll probably stay in there two or three weeks. You probably should feed it once a week if you can remember doing that. It'll probably last a couple of weeks anyway without being fed. But it, sourdough is persnickety. It has to be fed. And it's fed with flour and water. And that's it. Um, I had a recipe that was um, with yeast. Okay. Yeah, some of them start with yeast. And, and that's okay. And if it works for you. I, I like the idea of using the wild yeast because the yeast that we use in just a yeast bread is... Um, it's been invented by man, so to speak, okay? They have narrowed down the yeast that they, and they say, oh, this is the best yeast to use, okay? Where what's out there, yeah, sometimes you're not sure what you're going to get, but you're better off. It's natural, where the yeast is kind of manufactured. So I know people who have done that, and it has worked out well for them, and there are lots of sourdough, and I've tried to do with the yeast, but it didn't work for me either. So <laughs> this is work, so I'm, I'm, I'm going for it. So if all you do is mix the flour? Mix the flour and the water. And leave it up. And you want, you want to cover it. So I have old linen towels. You know, I go to the used store or an antique store, and you know those lovely old linen calendar towels that they have? I have a whole bunch of those, anywhere from the 60s through the 90s. And, and, and I just, all, all you do is leave, leave it across so you don't end up with getting bugs, okay? I accidentally put a towel on that I didn't realize had a little hole, and when I took it off the next morning, there was a little spider crawling around in my sourdough. So guess what happened? Went in the trash. So that was very sad. But anyway, when it gets time for bake day, um, some recipes say sourdough and then a package of yeast. But I don't want to use yeast. I want it to be au natural, so to speak. So this bread is made with only sourdough. And at one time in our history, many years ago, there was no commercial yeast. It was all sourdough. It was all sourdough. So um, we have, I, I even brought some butter. If you want. It, it, I will tell you it's pretty heavy stuff. I am still perfecting. Do any of you bake bread on a regular basis? You know how it is. You really have to get a feel for it. And, and I'm starting to get the feel for this, but it's still a little heavy. I, I believe I can get it a little. But um, in making this, it really is a matter of um, letting it race and then bringing it down again. And it's pretty much like making any other bread. It's just much more natural. So 
So it's a little more dense, but you can see it's got all those lovely holes. So it did rise quite nicely. <coughs> and, um... I want to eat it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll let you. I should have brought some jelly or something. So, um, any questions about that? I mean, that was really pretty much an overview but yeah so you're taking you, you have a you have sourdough culture you're taking a piece of it off and mixing it in with true you with always want to have that mother I mean they call the scobies a mother and that mother is the is is that thing that that will make the next the next batch just ju just like mothers do they make the next generation and that's what the mother of sourdough or anything it, so, so I, I, I think I have maybe two sort of conflicting things okay. in my head. Is one, one is like you're doing like you're culturing all of the dough that you're going to be baking with. Uh, versus, That's part of it. Versus like you taking a chunk and then mixing it in with, ah, with okay. more dough. Okay. Do you understand what I'm yeah. saying? Yeah. So you have your mother. So when you're going to get ready to bake, you take that mother out and you feed it. You let it set for a short time, usually just, just to warm it through. Then you take out a portion of that to use for your bread, and the rest of it goes in the refrigerator for the next time. Okay? Now, this portion is what you make bread. Yes. Now, you may only add more flour and water to it. Um, this... The recipe is flour and water and salt, I believe, is all it is. It's called a batard. And of course, I'm not French, so I'm probably not saying that right. You almost always feed, if I'm not yeah. mistaken, you almost always feed yeah. your sourdough star starter on the day you're planning to bake. Yes. Like in the morning, get up, feed it one last time so that it's very fresh and active mm -hmm. and you're going to be using that in your baking. Correct. So that might be a subset of a bigger bowl of it you had started that you're going to use. Yeah. You're going to take a little bit out of the bowl you started, get it prepped, feed it for your baking day, put the other stuff back in the fridge right. until you're ready to do right. that again. But, but it all needs to be fed. So. Okay. If it's as simple as just putting flour and salt and water, why do you need a stuff? Why do you need to feed it? You can just make it. And well, because you want it to rise, mm -hmm. and if you put if you put too much of everything into it, it's going to take a long time for it to start work because you've just pulled it out of the refrigerator for the most part. Okay, so it's cold, so it needs to warm, and you're going to put a little flour, a little water. You're going to feed it. And then you're going to make your bread. But it's, it's getting the spores out of the air, right? Yes, it is. Okay. Yes, it is. And um, there is some sourdough that you add eggs or um, herbs or cheese. You can add all kinds of different things. Olive oil, um, different kinds of flour. The, the other nice thing, if, if any of you have problems with um, gluten, um, this has a lot of gluten-free recipes, okay? It tells you how to make sourdough using gluten-free flour. I think it's rice and quino is what the quino? Yeah. Quinoa. Quinoa. Thank you very much. Yes, that's it. Um, and so, you know, exactly why you have to do this special step process. All I know is it works. And since I went for so many years that I didn't, never could make any sourdough, I was really happy that it worked and that I'm making bread. I've made pizza dough. I made this pizza dough and partially baked it, threw it in the freezer, and then I got home from work one night. Now I'm tired. David went down and got the crust and I had made some sauce already and had pizza in no time at all and it was really good <laughs> so you know and this other little book that you can get this you can um uh it's the adventures in sourdough cooking and baking it comes from the 70s okay 
I bought this on what's the eBay? eBay? No. Amazon. Am no, not Amazon. Craigslist. I, I can't. What, whatever it is, it's, it's a used book place um, on the internet. But you can get this through the library. Okay, we don't own it here. It's owned by another library, but you can get it. And this has recipes for cake and donuts, fruit cake, puddings. All of this with because remember, in years past there wasn't little packages of yeast in the store. They use sourdough for almost everything, and we forget that nowadays. That this is the way they people used to bake. So it's in the Laura Ingalls Wilder books. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> so. Mm -hmm. I don't remember if you mentioned what how long you've been been fermenting. Um, but have you guys seen like a yeah, I'm jump in your health and your families or mm -hmm. something like that? So the question was, has, have we seen um, a jump in our health and our families from eating fermented foods? Um, I don't know that I eat them enough. I should eat them more. I don't know that I'm eating and drinking them enough to have to to say yes I absolutely feel better because of these foods I think um, it's gonna be a different personal experience for everybody yeah I do this primarily because I like the taste I think it's fun to make it mm -hmm. I think the, the vegetables taste better and it prevents my vegetables from spoiling in my fridge because I didn't eat them fast mm -hmm. enough those are the primary reasons I do it. I am fortunate that I don't have any health concerns right now where I feel like I have to eat these for my health, but some people may be in that situation and may have better anecdotal evidence of it improving their health. And, and my husband and I, I'm 65, he's 72, and we don't take any medications. I don't know if that's the ferments or that's other things. And then you can see we both like to eat mm -hmm. <laughs> and we probably don't exercise near what we should or maybe not at all so uh, when you wait but when you look at that the fact that we take no medications and we're healthy and every time we go to the doctor they go I don't understand it <laughs> so uh, you know I I, th I think it's the food we eat and some of that is the ferments so it's kind of like a tool in your toolbox. Exactly. Get it that way. Exactly. <coughs> exactly. Is, is there a way to dehydrate uh, sourdough to be like the store bought? Apparently, but I'm not sure how to do it. But I'll bet you that it's. Uh, I'll bet you there's instructions out there someplace. You basically in your dehydrator on the on the sheet that you make fruit leathers with. Right. You spread it out and you dehydrate it, and then it granulizes. And what you have to do is you have to rehydrate it and feed it again. Mm -hmm. I haven't gotten to that part of it. Okay. <laughs> My son dehydrated the starter for me. And so once it's dehydrated, it will keep on the shelf indefinitely. Cool. Okay. There we go. It doesn't even I need to be frozen? No. No. Okay. No, because it's dried. Mm -hmm. And it looks like regular yeast, mm -hmm. but you still have to rehydrate it and feed it. Right. Okay, that, and that would make sense to me, but I've never done it, and, and I haven't even investigated it, really. I know you can. I've seen out there where it says you can do it. I've just never done that. So. And that's a good option if you just need to take a long break from making a sourdough, right. but you don't want to lose the work you've put into it. That would exactly. be a good option. Exactly. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, I have a question about um, fermented vegetables and the salts that you're using. Um, do you have any preferences, or are they better or worse? Or in my case, I can't the, the anti-caking agents that they use. The salts really bother me, so I tend to stick to sea salt. But then I find some are so strongly flavored, I have to be really careful with how much I use. Okay. You so, know, just so I've always I'm not I don't know how she she'll say how she feels. But I don't use any salt in my house that doesn't have color in it. Um, I, if if it doesn't, if if it's white, I won't use it um, because you don't really know what they use to make it white. 
and I'm kind of weird, but I, I know I probably am way over the top on some of these things. And so my husband loves the Himalayan sea salt. I use Redmond's. Mm -hmm. um, huh? Real salt. Yeah. And, um, but I've used Hawaiian salt and Australian salt, and, and I've used all of these in ferments. I will tell you the one thing about using any of these colored salts, they're colored because of the minerals that are in them, okay? So when they dissolve, sometimes those minerals don't dissolve too. So you end up with these little things floating around. They're not going to hurt you, but that's all I use in my ferments is colored salt of whatever. And, and they do have different flavors, you're right. Uh, you get one of those, um, I, I got an Indian black salt one time. It was beautiful, because it was just black, but it was very sulfurous. I did not like that at all. Great in the bath, though. Sulfur's good for your skin. <laughs> <laughs> so it didn't go to waste. <laughs> I guess it could be personal preference or if you have any restrictions you right. need to watch out for. I think what I've read is that you shouldn't use iodized. Right. Um, sea salt or kosher salt if you're going to use white salt. You right. do not need to go out and buy a special pickling salt. Just right. use sea salt or kosher salt. Right. What's wrong with iodized salt? Um, I think, I, I, I don't know exactly, it's just I know that I've read you shouldn't use iodized and I think it has to do with it being kind of a non, a, not a natural form, they're adding things to the salt, yeah. Well, I think the other thing is, is you have to understand that to make that, to, to make salt white, they, they usually use chemicals to take out all that color and all of those minerals. And, and so they're, they're using chemicals to, to take everything out and then adding the iodine back in that salt, the salt that you, the colored salt that I eat already has some iodine already in it. But it doesn't have enough that it's going to hurt anything. So I think that's why they say that because if you're buying iodized salt, it's being put in specifically and it, everything has already been removed. Okay.